Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Those of you joining us online, good morning to you also. We return to the book of Acts, chapter 22. And if you have your Bibles, would you turn to Acts chapter 22? We'll stand and take verses 17 through 22, but we should get the entire chapter this morning. So, having your Bibles and uh, ready or not, please stand for the reading of God's word. If you are in the cafe, please stand also. And if you are watching us online and you are able, why don't you stand also for the reading of God's word? Verses 17 through 22. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste, get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And they listened to him until this word. And they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Please be seated. Well, if you don't know what's happening, <clears throat> Paul was uh, asked to make offerings at the Jewish temple in Jerusalem by James, the same James, who authored the letter of James in, in the general letters of the Bible, the New Testament. And uh, it, it was a disaster. The whole, his enti this entire Jerusalem trip was a disaster for Paul. God, of course, would make it work. But uh, he's at the temple. There are false charges laid against him for defiling the temple and bringing Gentiles in. And so they... The mob surrounded Paul and were going to do him harm had it not been for the intervention of the Roman soldiers. Well, as the Roman soldiers were rescuing Paul and leading him up the steps, he asked if he could say a word to the mob, and it was, he was granted that, that moment. And we are in the middle of his testimony of Paul trying to reach his beloved Jewish brethren. This morning's message is entitled, Testimony to Fanatics, Part 2. Now, as he is continuing his story, his witness, his testimony, you know, we are witnesses of Christ, not lawyers. We say, well, this is what happened to me. Or this is what I know about Christ. And it is our story. And if there is a righteous and genuine attempt to live out the faith, it becomes a testimony. And he is giving this testimony to his fellow Jews, his countrymen, how Jesus became known and real to him. A, a Jesus who he was in the process of fighting against. And through this testimony, uh, again, God is going to overrule what the unbelievers are doing, what Satan would do. And though Paul's testimony did not succeed making any converts that we know about under these circumstances. I don't think anyone could have said anything differently to a mob such as this. And they were a fanatical mob. A fanatic is essentially one who has an irrational commitment that is accompanied by an irrational passion. And this is playing out as we go through the verses. It will just, it would glare out at us. There's no way to miss it. And hostile groups, fanatical mobs, uh, you can't reach them in that state. And Paul had this before. In Ephesus, there were those, you know, chanting, you know, great is Diana, the goddess of the Ephesian temple. And they, they too were beyond reach. Though Paul wanted to reach them, he was restrained. And so here is Paul, once a member of this very group, this identical group. He was once a member. And therefore, it is only natural to think that I, I can reach them. I can reach some of them. It, it, it is not 
given to us as an example of this is how you do it. I think if anything, what we get out of this 22nd chapter is this is not how you do it. And, you know, it'd be foolish to say, well, everything Paul did was perfect. Well, he's not Jesus Christ. He's a, he was one of the greatest men in the Bible, no question. But still, he made mistakes, and we, those mistakes are recorded for our edification. He'd be the first to say, yeah, learn from my mistakes, as any of us would say. He was, however, very successful when he preached in the synagogues, and he had the scripture open. Now, that's not guaranteed because he made enemies there, too. And Christ himself preached from the scripture in a synagogue, and then they wanted to throw him off a cliff for the things he went on to preach. Outside of Jerusalem, he made a lot of converts, Gentile and Jewish alike. There are lessons to be gained in all of this. And we preach when God opens the door. That is ideal, and not until then. And it is also ideal to use Scripture. Now, I'm using some of my personal experience, and you may have, uh, and I say that because maybe you've experienced something other. I personally have never felt obligated to preach Christ to people that I worked with in, in the world when, when I worked in the world. But I was always eager to preach Christ. And there's a great big difference. One is in the strength of the flesh. I just got to preach. I just got to preach. Or you, maybe you got guilt or maybe you just have this um, flaming desire. That's not enough. You've got to find out what works according to Scripture, according to God. And so that eagerness was always there. And I also do not recall ever having my personal testimony lead anyone to Christ. It has, in some cases, strengthened believers, but I do not recall of anyone. Oh, you get like, wow, that's interesting. Uh, well, what are we going to do next? Kind of a re reply. Uh, but I do recall also leading people to Christ using the word of God, preaching the scripture, a scripture that they and otherwise would not read themselves, bringing to them that which they did not have, God's word and explaining it to them in a way that they would understand it. That had, had yield much fruit. So when Paul writes to the Corinthians in the second letter, which he had already written chronologically at the time that he's here, here in Acts 22, he already wrote the Corinthian letters. He says, for, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Don't miss that. We are at war. Christians are at war with what Satan is doing to humanity, what the curse is doing to mankind, and what the world wants to um, advocate uh, against God. And so he says, we do not walk according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds and casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Weapons of our warfare are spiritual. The word of God is spiritual. And uh, there's nothing like it. If, if you are a Christian, you know this. Also, a mere good example in daily life alone cannot bring someone to Christ by itself. Just giving an example. I mean, it may attract them that they know the message already. It leads to it. But at some point, the gospel must be spoken. You're not just going to watch a, a Christian behave wonderfully and say, okay, sign me up. Whatever it is you're doing, uh, that, would, that would mean they were attractive to your behavior and not to the message from God to man. And, uh, you know, if, if you want to change how people think about God, you've got to preach the word of God. I, I, there's, there's no alternative. Now, uh, there are today... Uh, well, let me go back up a little bit. In preaching the gospel, we want to give an invitation, invite them into the family of God, that they can verbalize their faith. And so we change the world by changing how the world thinks about God, by using his word, as I, as I just mentioned. There are still fanatics among us, and they certainly have all peoples, the different types of people, different races, void of reason because they've canceled reason out. We speak, we think, we consider the liberals who want to change, you know, pronouns. He said, this is, this is madness. This is fanaticism. 
It is void of reason, of science. It is certainly against uh, morality. And you say, where does this stuff come from? Their brains aren't damaged, but their minds are. And the mind is what you do with the brain. It's what you do with your feelings. It's what you do with your will. You put it all together. You have the heart of the individual. And the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You see, that's a scripture verse. And that's how we preach to the unbelievers. We give them that, and then we say, that's scripture. That's what God says. The heart is deceitful above all things. That heart is you. It's you when you're not walking in rhythm with God. And of course, for us, we Christians, we're not ashamed of saying the God of the Bible, the God of the New Testament. Now, the coming of Antichrist will deploy a demonic fanaticism that will go beyond Nazi Germany. It will be global, such as the world has never seen. It, it is coming. In Revelation 6, when the fifth seal, remember the Lord took the scroll and there were seven seals and he began peeling them back. And each one he was, he was letting us know this is what's going to happen. And in Revelation 6, 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. That testimony is they did not count their lives dear to themselves. Not enough to cancel out God's word. They, they preached the blood of Christ and they held to their testimony to the death. Now, of course, the revelation is, is, all, is symbolic. I mean, they're not this huddle of slain Christians under an altar somewhere. It's a truth being expressed that God knows those who are his sacrifice, who loved him and died in the testimony of his son, Jesus Christ, of course. Revelation 20, verse 4, four, I saw thrones and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, Christ, to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's the millennial kingdom age. They will be with him beyond that, of course. <clears throat> so will we who believe. And so there you have God saying in advance, this is what's coming. There is going to be a global onslaught that is going to be completely intolerant of Christians. In fact, the church will be gone, but there will be tribulation converts and they will be executed for their faith. And God will protect, of course, his Jewish witnesses and the two witnesses, until the two witnesses will be protected until their ministry is complete. And then they will be executed. And then they will get up again. Second Thessalonians, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Well, remember, Paul wrote that 2,000 years ago. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Well, that is the Holy Spirit whom he's speaking. The Holy Spirit, God, is restraining evil. Evil is not in control, though it is allowed controls. And uh, Paul is saying, well, God is the one holding it, holding full-blown evil globally until he is ready. And we are fast approaching it. We've always been approaching it, but now we're, we can smell the sulfur. Uh, we're that close to the volcano. Verse 17 now, looking at our text, that's just the introduction and to catch up what's going on. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance. Well, a trance, a, a, a New Testament biblical trance, carries the individual beyond their physical senses into the supernatural realm. And they're awake. And God is revealing things to them that they otherwise would not know. Only three apostles are said in the New Testament to have had revelation by trance. Peter, of course, when the Lord said, 
uh, slay and eat Peter, uh, and then revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ given to John. The Lord says right out, I'm going to tell you the future with signs, with symbols, because these signs and symbols are timeless. And if I just give you words, well, words change. I mean, uh, now if you, you know, on, on, on payday, when I was in the world, I was happy and gay. Well, that word gay no longer means happy, and it has been hijacked. And, and so, uh, you know, language changes, but symbols remain, and that's why we get it this way. Hosea, in fact, I should just do this. Hosea chapter 4, verse 14, the prophet, um, actually, that's not the one I want. Skip it, never mind. Oh, we'll come back to that Hosea 4.14. But uh, God told the prophet that I have spoken to you uh, through, through signs, through images. Well, uh, returning to verse 17, um, what is so hard about believing a God who can create things from nothing, the universe, to believe that he can give us a vision? Well, I've not had a vision, but I have, at my conversion, it was as though Jesus were right there, right there with me. I could not see him, but I certainly sensed his presence and have continued to sense his presence. Uh, these things are, are, are lightweight things for God, for him to make himself known uh, to people. Well, uh, and this is what, you know, he's, but it's even a greater faith to just take his word for it as he told John. Well, moving on to verse 18 and continuing with what he saw in the vision as he's telling the, his Jewish audience there at the temple that uh, he, he saw Christ saying to me, make haste, get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. This was warning number one, and it was never rescinded for Paul, when Christ said, they're not going to receive your testimony in Jerusalem. This was years ago that he's telling about this story. Well, this happens right up to his last vis known visit to Jerusalem, which is this 17th chapter um, is, is telling us about. Um, <clears throat> later, right before he arrived, well, later in his ministry, he's prohibited from going into Asia with the gospel. And he's also warned on the way to this trip in Jerusalem that there is persecution waiting for you, Paul. But God never prohibited him from going to Jerusalem this time. As he shut him down going to Asia, he made it very clear, I don't want you going to Asia. He doesn't tell him, I don't want you to go to Jerusalem. He just tells him, you're going to be persecuted there. Paul said, I'm good with that. I, I, am, I am ready to die in Jerusalem. And uh, he had hope for converts, nonetheless. As I mentioned, God will use all of this. Those who do not walk with Christ naturally scoff at the fact that God talks to his people. In fact, there are some people that claim to be Christians. They don't believe God talks to his people. Well, my Bible, Jesus, in my Bible, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And he never, he did not say, they used to know my voice. Uh, we know the voice of the Lord, and there are times that God does speak to us and, uh, in, in many ways, especially if you're in, in ministry, because then there's that greater need, I, I, I believe, uh, for such encouragements. Verse 19, continuing, he says, So I said, Lord, they know that in er every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. So he's talking about his moment of conversion. The Greek is actually... Synagogue by synagogue, as he was looking to purge the promised land and beyond of Messianic Jews, Jews who believe Christ is the Messiah, uh, he is re retelling the story that he hunted Christians. We have to remember Israel was a nation. Their constitution was the law of God. It was a capital crime among other things, to blaspheme God. But that was for the nation. Paul took it outside of the nation, and he went up as far as Damascus, as far as he could get. There were other Jews at that time that were living a blasphemous life. Remember Elimus the sorcerer? He was Jewish, and he was into sorcery. Had he lived in Israel, that would have been a 
capital crime, but he lived far out of Israel on, on um, <clears throat> Crete. Well, Paul, in his zeal, is going beyond the law into other lands. And uh, verse 20, And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Well, Paul was, <clears throat> all the evidence points to him being a member of the Sanhedrin, that ruling government of the Jews. And so he was not to participate in the stoning itself, to throw the stones. And that's why he guarded the clothes. He's totally approved of it, demanded it in his heart. Judaism had just, again, been hijacked by the rabbis. It was not what Moses and the prophet, no longer was it what Moses and the prophets wanted it to be. Here's an illustration. In John 8, a Jewish woman is caught in the act of adultery. <clears throat> they assembled to stone her. What about the man? How come they weren't going to stone him? That's what the law required. Now I go back to Hosea chapter 4. And uh, there, Hosea has prophesied centuries earlier that God would recognize that the Jews had become hypocrites. And therefore, uh, well, I'll just read it. I will not punish your daughters when they commit harlotry, nor your brides when they commit adultery. For the men themselves go apart with harlots and offer sacrifice, sacrifices with a ritual harlot. Therefore, people do not understand. People who do not understand will be trampled. And so there the prophet is saying, uh, you're going to forfeit your right to execute the laws of the Constitution. And, and, and that's what was happening in the days of Paul. But they didn't see it that way, of course. Their fanaticism blinded them. Uh, all they could see was what they wanted and how the law could get what they want for them. And that's why the, in John 8, they wanted to stone the woman, but conveniently dismiss the man. Well, what did the prophet say about that kind of thing? We always see this in Christianity. We see Christians do things that the scripture has clearly spoken against, and they just either are ignorant to it or have dismissed it. Now, the deceptor had departed by this time, the scepter of capital punishment, because of their idolatry and hypocrisy. Now, false religions and false Christianity will justify killing their opponents. True Christianity does not do that. Uh, true Christianity does not justify killing those who will not receive Christ. And uh, no true God, incidentally, needs uh, people to violently protect his truths or his honor. God is God. He doesn't need any human to protect him. This is what Gideon's father said to him. If Baal is God, let him protect his own self. Well, John chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Yet his, his servants, we will be returning with Christ when at his second coming. And uh, there won't be much of a fight but uh, because he'll, he'll dispatch with the evil. Anyway, verse 21, then he said to me, now he's telling the story. He's speaking to the Lord. Lord, I was once a persecutor of, of your believers, of Stephen. And this is Christ's response. Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Verse 22, and they listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. He, he simply quoted what Jesus said to him. And that quoting, quoting Jesus, kicked the hornet's nest. What did Jesus say to him? Depart, for I will send you, verse 21, far from here to the Gentiles. Their fanaticism had taken over. Forget about their scripture that clearly said Abraham, their beloved father, had no less than 13 sons 
that were Gentiles, 12 of them by Keturah, after Sarah, one of them by Hagar. They completely forgot about that. They forgot about Isaiah saying that the Jews were to be a light to the Gentiles. They conveniently boxed that out of their fanaticism. They wanted their religion on their terms, and that's what they got. And so, yeah, when they, they, they respond this way, you have to say, I thought they were people of Scripture. Now, not all the Jews. No, certainly, because our Lord came, uh, was incarnate as a Jew. Paul is a Jew. Peter, all the apostles were Jews. Uh, so this certainly is not anti-Semitic. This is the history of the story. Other peoples have done the same. Well, we talked about those at, at Ephesus who were rioting against Paul. They weren't Jews. They were Gentiles. Satan doesn't care if you're a Jew or Gentile, if he can just get his talons into you to do what he wants you to do. Paul thought that he would awaken a compassion in them. It backfired. You know, seeing God's handiwork, seeing proofs of God, does not automatically make one a believer. If it did, when they saw the miracles of Christ, they would never have crucified him. Seeing God in person does not guarantee or does not in and of itself make one a believer. If it did, Satan would never have become Satan. Lucifer would still be an archangel, but he threw it away. Observation or acknowledgement of God still does not go far enough. It takes submission to the truth, to the revelation of God's word. It takes friendship with God. That's what establishes the soul, a confession of faith that he is the Son of God, that he was crucified and risen again, and that he is coming, he's coming back. What if Paul was given a do-over? Would he have used the word Gentile? And this is where it starts getting very much uh, helpful for us, I think. He would have to use the word Gentile. He would have to say the same thing because it was commanded by Jesus. And he's telling them the truth. He's giving them the story. It is a distinctive of Christianity to reach all people and all types of people as the Lord will allow. Jesus said, go into, world, into all the world and make disciples. And he said, preach the gospel to every creature. Now, it doesn't mean the birds and worms. and it's, it's just going, you know, when he said that, the sill, they had no concept of the church, especially Gentiles being equally righteous as Jews. They had no concept of these things. And so Jesus knew how to word it in such a way that you'd get the point and it would reach beyond the moment that he was teaching it. <clears throat> And so an early evidence of conversion to Christ is accompanied by a desire to share Christ. If you come to Christ and you say, whew, I'm saved. Well, let me go get myself a sandwich. Uh, some, and that's the extent of it. Uh, there's something missing. But when you come to Christ, you want to tell people about him. You want to share that what Jesus has done for you. And that he makes it available for everyone else. At least I did. It didn't work. Again, my testimony never made converts, made enemies. It was the sharing of scripture. Well, scripture, sharing scripture made enemies too. But it also made converts. Matthew 28, Jesus said, Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Are we mindful of that? This is a verse that you, every Christian should memorize. Teaching them to observe. It's not enough to make a convert. There must be discipleship. There must be instruction in righteousness. There must be conviction, exhortation. Uh, there must be uh, line upon line, truth upon truth, according to the scripture. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow a torrents of living water. So this is a church that highly emphasizes the scripture. Would you rather a pastor 
that just emphasized his opinions. Or would you want one that gives you his opinion based on the scripture? Uh, that would be my preference. There is a false sensitivity that cringes at giving the heart of God's message. There are those Christians that want to restrain the use of the Bible in trying to reach lost souls. This is not scriptural, nor is it effective. Uh, I do not agree with that approach. Uh, had he omitted Gentiles, he would have concealed the message. Well, Paul, you're never going to reach them. Paul would have said, I would never reach them with concealment. It is by giving them the truth. I am not responsible for what they do with the, tr the truth. I am responsible to preach it. What they do is on them. And that is true of every, every one of us. It would have been a compromise to win their toleration, their approval. Well, Christians are not looking to rock the boat of the world. We're looking to sink it in the lives of individuals who have fallen for what the world teaches in opposition to Christ. We deliver the message. The results are in God's hand. Here's Jonah. Take Jonah, one of the greatest evangelists as far as results go in all the Bible. An entire city was saved. In this short sermon, here it is. Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Well, that's not a very positive message. That's not going to make the Ninevites feel good about you or themselves, and you've got to make people feel good about themselves. Well, then there's no conviction. And if you can't convince a person that they're dirty before God, they cannot get cleansed by, by the blood of the Lamb. You cannot be in a state of denial when it comes to who you are in the presence of God. There are sinners that are lost, and there are sinners that are saved, and it is up to the individual. And so you, whoever you may be, who are engaged in advocating sin, who are engaged in either practicing or advocating, for example, sexual perversity, don't say you've not been warned. And that's the problem. They don't want the warning. They hate the warning. You will perish in your judgment unless you repent. This is the gospel message. What else are we going to say? Now, you know, I want you to feel good about yourself, and Jesus will just, he just loves you the way you are. No, that's not the gospel. And if you're insecure to the point where you, you can't trust God any further, then you're probably going to push against him. Anyone listening... Are you so desperate for watered-down converts that you dodge biblical examples, biblical teachings? Let me give you Peter's teaching in his day, which is applicable to, this, to, to us right now. Look what all scripture is. Peter's going to come out and say, this is an example. In 2 Peter chapter 2, in the sixth verse, he's talking about now the judgment of God. And he says that God... <clears throat> turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. You're not done. But that alone is something, oh, don't say that. You, they cringe at giving the truth to those who have everything except the truth, the very thing they need. Oh, you're going to, you know, you're going to alienate them from you. No, the gospel is an ultimatum. You take it or you leave it. It costs the blood of Christ. He's inviting you to take it. If you decide to trample it, that's on you. Don't say God didn't treat you as an adult. Peter continues. <clears throat> he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward, us, would live ungodly, us this time in history. Peter is saying, what I'm going to tell you is coming from way back in Sodom and Gomorrah, is present in my day, and this truth will continue until Christ comes back. He turned them into ashes. That's people and buildings and animals, everything else that was there. It was the wrath of God. God has a wrath. You're not obligated to suffer that wrath. There is an escape, and it is through Christ. And if you think you're too strong, you think that makes, means you're weak 
Uh, well, it, it does. Mankind is weak compared to God. What do you think you are on his level? You think your goodness is going to somehow make God go, wow, I need a guy like you in heaven. <laughs> well, again, he had to preach it. It's a false peace if built upon concealment of all Jesus Christ began both to do and to teach. And that's what he said. And I'm always amazed. Somebody visits the church, and they hear me preaching from the word, and they're offended. Well, you're going to have to be offended. It's not my intention to hurt your feelings. My goal is to give you the truth so you can make the decision, a, a sensible one. But don't think you're going to come here and stop me from preaching what I know is true because you don't like it. Or share it. There's nothing obnoxious in that. I don't go to wherever you are and walk out when you're preaching on the stuff you believe in. Uh, anyway, I don't know why. I, I say that because it's always been perplexing to me. Why would anybody go to a house of God and um, fuss about what God has to say? Well, coming again back to this, we are the salt of the earth, and the salt is not supposed to try to taste like sugar. It is salt, and there are many that are trying to get the message to be sweet according to the flesh. Matthew chapter 5, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how then shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot of men. I think that says it pretty clearly. Salt is supposed to be salt. We are the salt of the earth. And we try to, you know, well, let's not offend the unbelievers. Paul, would you use that word Gentile again, knowing it, it sent them into a rage? Absolutely, I would, because that's the message. And they needed to hear this. Our light needs no dimmer switch. G. Campbell Morgan said, there is a toleration which is treacherous. There is a peace which is paralyzing. Thus, in time, the church must say no to those who seek communion on the basis of compromise. Amen, brother. In return for preaching the gospel and standing up to it as best we can, we will be laughed at. We will even be hated. We will be persecuted. But we must hold to our truth and make biblical converts nonetheless. That's what we're talking about from the revelation of those saints who were beheaded for their testimony. They are upholding the scripture. Matthew 10. And you will be hated for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. I believe every word of that. I don't want to be hated, but it really is not a big thing to me. If I know I'm right in Christ, being hated is not going to stop me from preaching Christ. May it never. The world has talked itself into hating the best thing that ever happened to it. That's them. I was once in that group too. I am not now. And that's this is Paul's situation. Verse 23. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes, they threw dust into the air. This is that fanatical frenzy over the word Gentile. Now, Someone may want to come to me and just start that, you know, well, we've got to be nice. We've got to, look, preaching the truth doesn't mean you're being mean. It's mean to withhold it. Paul said of those in the Roman letter, those who suppress the truth are going to be dealt with. Now, it does not mean we are indiscriminate. It does not mean we're careless. We're dependent on the Holy Spirit. But the bottom line always comes, it always comes to the bottom line. You are a sinner. You will stand before Christ. And the message of the gospel will come up if you've heard this message. And I would tell them, you've heard it. Now you have no excuse. You've got the message. And some would say, I want more. And others would, would shut down. Verse 24, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. Uh, why not just ask me? Why, why, what's with the beating to get me to tell you what I'm ready to tell you? Rome has reserved brutality for non-citizens. And there was, there was no hesitation to, to administer it. So the Gentiles 
these Roman soldiers, they didn't speak the Hebrew. So they don't know what happened. So the centurion says, well, what happened? What did he say that enraged them again? Uh, well, you know, because the Romans understood that they were dealing with, you know, those who hated them. They hated the Gentiles. <clears throat> the Jews in those days were not, you know, it wasn't a secret. Even in many circles today, it's not a secret amongst them. <clears throat> but there are other peoples, peoples out there that are fanatical about their race or fanatical about this, their religion or something. Liberals are fanatical about their right to kill the unborn. Because someone has told them that when a woman conceives, the life has begun. That is a child forming in their womb. It is, it is, not, it is a human being at con, at con, when they conceive. Did I use the word conceal for conceive? Good. It was one of those. Anyway, uh, the age-old illustration is, you know, you had all of these people insisting on a woman's right, but yet if you crush the egg of an eagle, oh, man, they'd want to they, they'd run you through a wood chop, uh, what do you call it, chipper. That's the hatred they have. It's an eagle's egg. There's life in that egg. Well, what about a human being? What about when there's life in the human being? Anyway, Oh, it's an old argument, but it is a true argument. Verse 25, and as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, uh, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Now, these thongs are leather strips or cords of rope. Here, they are handcuffing him. That's what's going. They have not yet reached the point where they're going to tie him to the post. That's a second. It's coming up next. Verse 26. Then the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Um, <clears throat> centurions are commanders of over 100 men. There were many of them in Jerusalem, because they had a large Roman pr uh, military presence there on the Temple Mount, the Antonia Fortress. There was a larger fortress, or uh, army, of Roman soldiers in Caesarea where they're going to send Paul for his protection. But suffice it to say, there are a lot of Roman troops here because they knew how volatile Jerusalem was. And within about six, seven years from this point, it's going to erupt. And for four years, they're going to fight it out in Jerusalem with Rome until the Romans destroy the temple and destroy the city. And then others will flee to Masada. The Romans will deal with them also. Um, it's just some very heavy uh, stuff going on in, in this time in history. Anyway, it would have been a crime to conceal uh, the fact that uh, Paul's citizenship. Once he knew Paul was a citizen, he had to go to his commander. The centurion went to his commander and said, uh, you better be careful. He's a citizen. That struck terror into them. Verse 28, we'll see the commander, Lysias, uh, Isaiah's covering it up in the next chapter. The commander answered with a large sum, verse 28. Well, no, verse 27, I didn't read that. Then the commander came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? He said, yes. Verse 28, the commander answered with a large sum, I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, but I was born a citizen. Drama music there. Verse 29, then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him, and the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman citizen because he had been bound. Now, they knew if you mess with a Roman citizen, Rome took it as messing with Rome. And they would just come down very hard on anyone who bothered their citizens. Uh, this here in verse, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> Verse 29, where uh, they had him bound, he, uh, because he had bound him. That's to the post to be flogged. Verse 25, they handcuffed him. Verse 29, they tied him to the post. And that's where the crime was. Not in handcuffing him. They could restrain, but they could not flog him. And the fact that they took it that far already put them in hot water. And they were in panic mode. And verse 30, the next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, 
He released him from his bonds, those are the handcuffs now, and the commander, the chief priest, and all the council to appear and brought Paul down to set him before them. We're almost done. So he remains under arrest for the inquiry to be completed, but they take the cuffs off of him. This begins a five-year ordeal for Paul. Two years in Caesarea, another three uh, in Rome and time in between. Loss of freedom, but the gain of much lasting fruit, not just fruit. You can make flash converts, but to have those converts become disciples and persevere in the faith, that's lasting fruit, which Jesus promised. In this five-year time, he will write Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And aren't we glad? You want to get a look at the church, read, read Ephesians. What the church should be, you, you read Ephesians. Uh, and it is a little painful. Not only do I believe the Bible, but I like it. I like what it says. I don't, I don't care enough to abandon it because someone else does not like it or does not want me to like it. Not only do I love the word of God, I like it. You know, love is an act of the will. Liking is an emotional thing. If Jesus said, commanded us to like our enemies, we all would have a big problem. And aren't we glad he didn't say that? But he says, you better love them. You better treat them the best you can in the interest of saving their souls. Uh, so not only do I believe the Bible I like what it says, and I like all of it, and I feel no need to apologize for any of it. Uh, the, the parts that um, I understand, I find not difficult to make others understand either, it is one of the beauties of the simplicity of the word. Well, we're gonna, I'm going to pray and close this session of worship through the word, then we're going to take communion. So as I'm praying, the men, uh, please, uh, if you would... Uh, be activated. <clears throat> our Father, your word is a lamp to our feet, and every Christian should love it, for in it are the words of life and eternal life. I pray, Lord, that if any have been listening, that your spirit has convicted them, that they, are, they need to be right with you, that they need to verbalize a submission to you, according to your scripture. If you've been listening and you'd like, you would like to open your heart to Christ, then do it. <clears throat> what stops you? You're either going to believe what people say about the Bible or you're going to listen to what the Bible says. It's your choice. If you would like to receive Christ into your heart, here comes the invitation. Make this confession. If you say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I have broken the commandments of God. I am guilty. It takes one sin to damn my soul, and I have many. And I ask you to forgive me for all of it because of what you did for me on the cross. I ask that you would not only save me from a judgment to come from my sin, but that you would also be ruler over my life now and forever. And I give my life to you. Now, Father, if anyone has made this confession... May they want more of you. May they not be ashamed of their confession. We commit these things to your hands in Jesus' name. Amen.